kid's gonna be the best kid in the world. This kid's gonna be somebody better than anybody ever knew. I'm gonna fool you. That's right. I have roused a little alligator. I don't toss a little whale. I don't handcuff lightning those under the bed. That's bad. Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I ain't met so sick. <laughs> scoreboard out there. It's not about winning. It's about you and your relationship to yourself and your family and your friends. Being perfect is about being able to look your friends in the eye and know that you didn't let them down because you told them the truth. And that truth is, is that you did everything that you could. There wasn't one more thing that you could have done. Can you live in that moment? As best you can. Clear eyes and love in your heart. <clears throat> With joy in your heart. If you can do that, Joe, then you're perfect. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not point your fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that, and that ain't you. You're better than that. Never, 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 never. 
Eager to learn. Eager to learn. Willing to question. Yes. Dependable. Yes, that's a good one. How about being engaged in the class? Be yes. participate. Yes. Willing to participate. Okay, so now I have a question. What are, those are some of the signs that you've seen. Now, what are some of the reasons you think that you have students that are not motivated in class? What do you think some of the things that they are going through that would keep them from wanting to be motivated in the classroom? Personal, Personal, Personal issues. Personal issues. Financial issues. Same thing, cares of life. Yes, anything? I heard something over here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Health issues. Yes. They have, they feel like there are bigger things going on outside of school that needs their attention besides what's going on in the classroom. So they're going to put that as priority. They don't put school as a priority. So some of the signs that would change if the students, what if they're a first-generation college student? Do you think that that could possibly, you could kind of hone in on that and keep them motivated because you're like, you're the first person to go to college in your, in your family? How proud would you feel when you can graduate and tell your family, hey, I did it. You know, I'm the first to do it. Or what if, there are some kind of ethnic when they feel like they're a minority in the classroom. And not necessarily with ethnic, but maybe with beliefs of religion or politics or however it is, different beliefs that make them feel that, you know, it's keeping them from being motivated because maybe they're not part of, you know, they don't feel or think the way that the rest of the class does. So maybe they're not wanting to be outspoken. Or trying to support a family, as you guys said. And then emotionally, what if they are the breadwinner of the family? Not only is it a financial toll, but it's an emotional toll, too, because you're thinking, oh, my God, am I going to go home and the electricity's cut off? And my kids are calling me, and they're like, hey, I, you know, I, I, the lights are off. Well, I'm in class till 10, so light some candles, grab some flashlights, because mom or dad's not going to be home until we get this taken care of tomorrow. So those are the types of things that I don't know if you've ever had to thought, but, you know, if you've gone through those things personally, but you have to understand that our students go through those on almost a daily basis or a weekly basis. Those are the types of things that we deal with as instructors, not only to try to motivate them to stay engaged in class, but we're trying to emotionally support them as well. All right, so. Someone also said help. Not necessarily, I don't, I don't think this is what you were thinking of. It could be But you're right, sometimes you have individuals, students in your class, mental disorders. And I'm not talking about, I mean, of course I am talking about some of the mental disorders, but you also have students that 
you're like thinking, and it's in, you know, none of us are actual medical doctors in here, and if you are, I apologize, but we can't sit there and diagnose them, but we know, because we have read textbooks, we know exactly what people are saying when they're OCD, or they have maybe post-traumatic stress, or if they have um, some kind of mental, um, when it comes to intellectual learning, they're having a disability with that, or we have people that are dyslexic, that maybe they, you know, don't read the same as everybody else, or if you have an individual that is, maybe has outbursts in class, and so we've had some students like that that are Asperger's. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Some of my students identify whatever they have, and they talk about it, that makes it easy for me to help them deal with it, but some of them stay unidentified, Yes. and it's, at some point, it's too late, you know, down, you know to help them out. They're usually quiet and whatever you do, but I don't realize that some of them have raised small IQ or something or whatever. And that's what we're going to talk because about. Because we don't today. have access to that right now. Right, we don't. I mean, yeah. we seriously do not, um, we can't do like a health screening on our students when they come in because, I mean, the American Disabilities Act, how many of you are lawyers in this room? So you know that we can't discriminate when it comes to someone wanting to enroll in higher education. So there are things, uh, you know, there are areas that are going to be difficult for us because we're not trained psychologists or psychiatrists to help someone deal with it, but we're going to see some ways that we can maybe identify with the student to maybe reel them in at the beginning, and maybe it's not necessarily an intellectual or an emotional, but we just notice that they're not participating and how we can motivate them to participate and maybe they'll be a little bit more open with us what's well, going can on. Can you have notes next to them or have, like for example, I had a student who doesn't speak near me and the doctor Abby told me that she has a stroke. Yes. But she does very excellent, you know, work. Right. So now I consider that when I put her grades down because if she's having that issue and she can't speak clearly. So now I let other students help her say the stuff that she wants to say. No, you know, but before that, I was like, what's wrong with her? Well, one of the things, um, as a career college, and I don't know if you're comfortable doing this, but um, coming from the modular team, every month the modular students have to go through what's called an interview workshop. And so they're interviewed one-on-one -on -one with an individual. and during this process we give them feedback and if they're not speaking correctly or clearly or if they're too soft-spoken we give them that feedback and at that point maybe there is something that caused them to have some kind of speech impediment so during that one-on-one -on -one, I wouldn't just come out and say why are you talking like that like, why, why can't you just speak clearly why can't you just you know I mean what's wrong with you no I would ask them say well you know when we were talking I noticed that you're pronouncing some things, um, you know, and, and I would try to like draw it out of them to see in a way that doesn't feel threatening, it doesn't feel like, you know, I'm trying to, you know, make them feel stupid or make them feel dumb or make them feel like there's something wrong with them when in actuality she had a stroke. Well, yeah, I mean, she's paralyzed and her speech is going to be impacted by that. So it's really about taking that student one-on-one -on -one and trying to figure out what's wrong with them and why um, they're not doing as great as you would like them to, or you feel that they are capable of doing, and that's what we're—that's what this is about today. Our in service. I'd like to yes. <clears throat> hi, in there for a second, yeah. Lenore. Um, yeah. I had a, a student that um, I'm not too sure what's wrong with her. Uh, I know that there's some type of mental deficiency. Uh, she comes to school but does not come to class, so she would sit in the computer lab, right? So um, I had to teach this last semester. And after I get class started, I run over to the computer lab and say, such and such, it's time to come to class. And the times Dr. Larby has brought her to class, and some other instructors have brought her to class. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure what the missing link there is. Uh, and she's, she's almost finished with the program, and she's a C student, but some, for some reason she could not perform this term, and um, I can't say, what, are you crazy? Or, or <laughs> you, you, you like to, but you can't, 
right? And this is this doesn't mean that all our students suffer from some type of deficiency, but this is our this is our these are our students. This is our population. This is our demographics. This is this is who we cater to. That student has a zero chance of getting a college education anywhere else. No one will take her. FSCJ won't take her. She cannot go anywhere and get an education. This is her last place. This is her last opportunity. Uh, do we cater to her? Do we bend backwards for her? Do we have to work with her? Uh, yes, because this this is what separates us from our competition. Now, you know, UNF is not going to say to her, "Oh, sweetie, you missed the final exam. Can you come to me after class and sit in my office?" And no, they're going to say, "Sorry, you missed the final F." So it's it's a um, it's a <laughs> it's a difficult task we perform, especially when we have students like this in our classroom. Usually, they're the ones with the with the bad attitude, it's the ones that won't stay off the cell phone, it's the ones that walk in and out of class, probably they are the ones that need most of the motivation, most of the encouragement, most of the help, most of the one-on-one. -on -one. What I've tried to do in the past with those students is challenge them, give them something extra, put them in charge, have them lead a group to, to give them that sense of responsibility to, to stick with the program. Otherwise, we lose them. And, uh, and it's easy to lose students because our students are going through a lot. Yeah. So it's up to us to make sure we identify these students and work closely with them, even if it means having to go to the computer lab and pull them out of there and say, hey, time to come to class. So, so part of motivating a student is um, it tends to be harder um, when you're dealing with these types of issues. It really does. And I'm not saying that we have an answer for everything because we don't. Um, I'm just like you. I mean, I'm, when I'm teaching a group of students and they're coming to me and I can tell that they're just not engaged and they're not wanting to do what they're doing, it's because they have something else that's on their mind. We have these old things that says, be here now. Why well, I, I would constantly want to get that and just stick it up in the room and just say, be here now. You know, this is your kind of safe haven to kind of put everything that's outside away for now to be selfish and come here and do something for yourself to make you a better person. So, why motivating? So, why should we spend time motivating our students? What, what kind of benefit does it help us? Why Job security. <laughs> You're running to the next it, easier. Easier. it does make teaching easier. Helps with our attrition, right? That's what we're talking about. Our attendance, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Our business model. Anything else? It helps us achieve our goals. Yes. Um, as, a teacher, as an instructor. You want them to learn and they're learning. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, it's okay. You have goals as well as an instructor. It's okay to say that you, I mean, when I was a child and I was like, there's no way I'm going to want to grow up and say I want to be a teacher because it's such a thankless job. It, it truly is. And you sit there and sometimes you're like, why do I do this? Why do I come in every day or once a week or a couple of few nights a week? Why do I do this? Especially when you have students that are just sometimes so nasty to you. And then you have your boss saying, you're dropping the student, you need to get this advising, you need to get this appeal, we need to make sure we have attendance, you got to get this, you know, you're constantly being, you know, you're, you feel like you're getting beaten down. But then at the end of the day or at the end of the term or at graduation, when you have that student that walks across the stage and they're crying and they come up to you and they're thanking you, just like your student, you said that yesterday or on Thursday, yeah. yes, she thanked him because of what he did for her. So yes, it's... It's goals of what an instructor, it makes you feel good. It's rewarding. That's right. There's nothing wrong with saying that it makes you feel good. I got another student. And she, she graduated a few terms ago. And I, a, a tremendous financial hardship, right? Um, she was a pizza delivery person, and uh, then she was a manager of a little Domino's pizza, right? This gal always struggled financially. Her car was breaking down. And, you know, difficult to come to school. Very, very, very bright young girl. Extremely bright, right? So over the years, 
a lot, you know, a lot of motivation, a lot of encouragement, a lot of support. You can do this. And sometimes it breaks your heart because your students tell you, I can't afford to come to school. I don't have money for gas. I'm broke. My car broke down. And these are all real problems. She was evicted. Couldn't afford to pay the rent. So for since she was the manager at Domino's Pizza and had the uh, key to the store, for months she slept on a cot in the back of the store at Domino's. And it, you know, it kind of breaks my heart because I would love to say, here's 50 bucks, you know? Or let me give you a ride home. And by the way, that is absolutely prohibited. <laughs> you know, there, there is no fraternization and there is no helping students and there is no giving them a ride. We would get in a lot of trouble for that. It just wouldn't be worth it. But your heart kind of breaks for that. So anyway, she's approaching graduation. She's looking for work. And uh, she applied for 9-11 uh, dispatch, right? Uh, there were 30 people competing against her. And she went through the first interview, the second interview, passed the third interview. She had to uh, complete a typing course. So she has to fashion to type. Because nowadays, when a, someone call, can, calls the 911 line, the dispatch operator types in the complaint and sends it electronically to an officer's laptop <laughs> in the car, right? She was the fastest typer of all 30 candidates, and she got the job, and she has one hand. So, and now she's successful, she's working in her career in the field, she's a dispatch operator for uh, Clay County. But again, it's those examples that we've got many, many, many successful stories. And I think what I do to motivate myself is I think of my success stories. Those students that have become corrections officers, police officers, that have gone to work in the, in the, in the private field and, and with insurance companies, for lawyers, and you, it's, it's a good portion of it. We have a great product. We provide an excellent education. Uh, the student has to want it, and those you have to encourage, some that, you know, that don't. But I think overall, uh, you know, we, we do a pretty darn good job. All right. So we're talking about motivating our students and how can we identify students that are having difficulties. So real quick, what I would like you to do is I'd like you to grab your rubric that you have sitting in front of you for the classroom observation. Page three. It says lesson lecture and um, interspersed lecture with student centered learning activities. As you're going to see throughout the rubric, oh, I apologize. It's this one here that actually has a description of what a one, two, three, four, five, those are. So on page, like I said, on page three. The first one is talking about student centered activities. And you're going to see a lot. A lot of the questions that you're graded on, a lot of the areas you're graded on, this is the rubric for how you get your answer or how you get your number. So, a number five says, had students actively involved in meaningful student-centered activities for the entire class per period, per hour that the observation was taking place. All right. When you're sitting here, just like today, and I'm here, and I'm wah, 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 I'm sure that at the end of this, there's a few things you're going to take away, but you're not going to remember everything that we went over today. All right? And that was only, we're only going to take like an hour, a little over an hour. Think about the four-hour time frame that you see your students every week. How much information do you truly think that they are going to remember at the end of your lecture or at the end of your class? And so what they're saying is that they like to see student-centered activities to kind of bring that information that you're talking about into reality, into a career application. All right. George was, given, was telling us, um, Ms. Beckhart that's leaving us, she, um, one of the craziest things he was telling me, and I was laughing when he was telling me, is that he walked into a classroom and she had someone handcuffed up against the wall. And she was doing a pat-down on him. And he walks in and he's like, did something happen? 
or was it just part of an example that she was giving? And I started laughing. I was like, yeah, because sometimes you're thinking, yeah, I'd like to pat down my students before they walk in because I don't know what's going on. Right? I mean, I wish I, had, I, was like, I wish I could pat down my kids before they come in the house and, you know, do things like that. But it's like those things, the students are going to remember, oh, my gosh, she, like, whipped out the handcuffs and she put them on them and bam. All right? And I know that not all of our lectures can be that exciting or can be that, you know, interesting. I mean, right, I see Ms. Corsica, she's like laughing. And I was like, I definitely can, like, I feel you there. But we have to make it interesting so they want to come back the next week or they want to come back the next day, no matter what the information is that we are giving them. And so when they walk in, they want to see that you have some kind of activity. And it doesn't have to mean that you're like super activity every 15 minutes or whatever. But you have to make them, that's part of keep getting them engaged, getting them motivated to, you know, get the information in. So the second page, or the fourth page, the one after that, that's really where this motivation comes in. Because periodically checked for understanding. If you look at that, especially the number four, I'm not even going to look at five. Let's just look at four. Checked individual students to ensure subject content was understood after every new key point was emphasized and had students echo the point in their own terms. So I've, like, I observed so many instructors. I observed so many on this campus. And I realized that our instructors are just so they are just so involved in their field. They understand, they have such a good understanding of what they're teaching, and they just throw out questions. And that's what you want. You're trying to throw out questions. Well, that's what we're doing today. I've been asking you questions, but I haven't specifically said, Ms. Cruz, what do you think about this? Or Mr. Spivak, what, what do you think about this? I, don't, I haven't been picking on someone and, and it's asking them, and that's part of what an instructor has to do. An instructor has to see that a student that maybe isn't engaged you want to ask them, and it's not that you're calling them out, but maybe you need to hear from them. Or you have the students like, they're just like excited and they want to share, you know, what you're asking. And so you want to call on them too because they need that praise. They need that motivation to like, you know, show how much they know. And so that's why we really emphasize asking individual questions, making sure that you're engaging with each student one-on-one -on -one in your classroom to see what they can bring to the table. So that's part of that rubric. Does anyone have any questions so far about this? <coughs> We're going to go over it a little bit more. All right, but I went through and I highlighted on that page alone all the areas that's talking about individualized questions being asked in the classroom. Ask questions of all students. That one, I didn't even have to highlight anything specific. That just asks it right there. The next one, evaluate the degree of student understanding. Again, you're one-on-one -on -one asking questions. And the last one, comments. The instructor asked a total of X amount of questions during the hour, and the students asked the X amount of questions during the hour. How are they, you know, involved with the instructor? And, there, and there's many ways you can do it. I've seen some instructors where, as all the students stand, and they have to answer the question correctly. If they get the answer correctly, then they sit down. If not, they've got to remain standing. I've also seen uh, these rapid-fire drills where someone stands and they've got to sit in the back of the class and they've got to answer as many questions as they can until they get bumped and then somebody else stands up and tries to answer as many questions as they can. And it's fast paced and it's, and it's um, exciting. So, as an instructor, as, as instructors in here, being the captain in your classroom, right? Because that's what I'm going to call you now. I'm going to call you captain. How can we enhance the self-efficacy of our students, especially those that we see that maybe aren't necessarily engaged, but maybe they're kind of holding back or they're shy as to wanting to speak out? Because remember, what was self-efficacy? It was knowing that you can do something. Well, maybe they don't know that they can do it. They, they think they can, but you have to make sure that they can say, I thought I could, I knew I could. So what are some of the things that we can do to promote that in our classrooms? Yes. Well, I, when I grade um, assignments and things, I put notes on my paper, like, great job, and, um, you know, kind of like empowerment. Yes. And so I, I'll do things like that, and then if somebody is kind of like introvert or whatever, you know, it would be nice that if you could share with this with the classroom next time. Okay. No, that's good. That's really good. Yes, sir. 
Well, sometimes I'll have students who'll say, like, I can't do accounting. They'll just say, no, I've already failed this class before or whatever. And what I do is I, is I don't argue with them. I'll have them put them on the board and say, here, okay, let's start on the problem. And I have them do it. Then after they've even, then after they've done some and everything, a lot of times still that you know they're like I can't do it. I'm like you just did it, you know. So it's kind of su it succeed is. by success type of thing. Do you have all of them come up to the board and do it? Yeah, yeah. I, know, I, I tell them they're not on their own. In other words, I rotate through. Uh, and of course, of course, when you observed me was not in accounting. That was business. So right. that that was not as much of that. But with the accounting, I'll have them go up and. In fact, one of the best situations I ever had is I taught in a classroom and they had all blackboards all the way around the room and I would give each student nice. a problem, give each one a blackboard and have each student do the problem, explain it to the class mm -hmm. as they went. So really, so, and I've had students before say, you know, I call it my five minute professor. They'll say, gee, you know, this is a lot harder than it looks, you know, because they've seen you up there and they make it, they make it look so seamless, you know, it looks like it's so easy, uh, but, you know, doing it is not, it's not as easy as it looks. Right, absolutely. Anybody else want to share? Oh, come on, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> what, I, what I feel from a career standpoint is I challenge them to do two presentations and I'll give them the topic and then they have to get up in front of the class and give that presentation along with a PowerPoint and I teach them about PowerPoints, that it's not cut and paste, etc. what PowerPoint should really be to enhance their presentation, not distract from it. And I've had, I remember once, several years ago, I had one student said, I can't do it. I said, okay, fine. You write it and you prepare it and then you videotape it at home and bring it in for yes. the students. And the student was trying to get me to agree to not let them do it, but they came into class, stood in front of the class and gave one of the best presentations I've ever heard. Yeah. So it's just helping them to, the easiest thing is I can't, and if you let them, they won't. That's, that's right. But that's if right. you help them and encourage them, uh, and then that I think goes to a self-efficacy that once they see they can do it um, and, and so I, I think they, they appreciate that. I've, I, a lot of times I tell them I never had to write a term paper at work but I sure had to give a lot of presentations Right. and I try to convince them. Of that. No, and that's good. Do you have something? Oh, well it's kind of the same because I think me and Dr. Kiel are kind of in the same area in that sense. I just kind of make it simple in a sense. I don't want to have like teach intro to finance stuff. Keep like it simple. Right, exactly. <laughs> Kiss model, I use it all the, all the time because, for instance, you know, like a lot of kids, like I tell them, you know, well, I can say, well, you need to go get a finance jacket or something. I just do it in Excel. And I let them come up and try to do it. So Excel does all the stuff for you. Mm -hmm. You just kind of really just go bare bones. I break it all the way down. Something that, that maybe we could probably get in 20 minutes or 10 minutes. If I had to take <laughs> A whole class, and I normally teach one night a week here. In the next class, I really make it very simple, so then they get the basis of it. Yes. Then they apply it. Then once they understand it, then we can move on. So Absolutely, I think that works for me. Yes. I was talking about before we came, before we started here. I was talking with them. I was saying that usually in accounting one, there's a point where I. I first start off, I talk about increasing. At some point, I put the debits and credits on the board, and usually there's an audible gasp in the room when I first put it up there. And then these same students, when they're on accounting too, it's like old hat. You know, I throw, oh, yeah, we know that. That's like, you know, everything is like, by the time they get them, you know, by the time I get them into the next course and they're working through, it's like, oh, yeah, we know all that, you know. Yes. It's like, and it makes, the, it makes them feel good that when they walk in the first day of class and you're putting stuff on the board, they already know what it is. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I like that. And so you can see the light bulbs like, oh, and, and you kind of, you already have their attention to want to expand on that. All right. So there was an experiment conducted. And what they did is they had 132 college freshmen that were in an intro psychology course. And they decided um, that they would send out an email or they would encourage the students to send an email to the instructor or the professor for extra credit. So, 76 emails were sent to the professors, and those 76 students were randomly assigned to two groups. Either they were the control group, or they were part of the self-efficacy enhancing group. And the email response for the control group just said, thank you, you're going to get your extra credit points. But the self-efficacy group went into a little bit of detail. And they thanked them, and they recognized them for something you know, that they were doing in class and whatnot. And they said, you know, remember, don't hesitate to contact me if you ever have questions. They're trying to build that connection with their student. And the result was the email, of course,
course improved not only the student's grade, but the student's self-efficacy as a whole. Right. Not just for that class, but as, in, you know, in their college freshman year. And so it just takes something as simple as, you know, sitting there and talking to your student real quick and just thanking them or giving them, you know, some guidance on something that will open up and help them along the way. And I'm sure a lot of you probably already do this. Yes, sir. Um, you always tell my students, if you know you're going to be out of class, to send me an email or whatever, any questions. And I get very, very few emails, very few times will I ever... Uh, and I, I wonder what that is. Is the students they, they seem to be very, or they'll say, "Oh, I, I can't make it." You know, can I send you? And I'll say, "Just just email the assignment." They don't want to do it for some reason. There's a there's a big hesitancy. So I don't know what. I mean, and I even tell them up front the easiest way to get to contact me is you know, shoot me an email and then you know. So what I noticed with that, I was in the um, one of the computer labs one day, and the student came up to me and he goes, "Do you know how to attach a document to an email?" You know, he had Facebook up, and he was going to town on Facebook, right? He was posting his pictures of his crazy, you know, little shots of himself. But yet, he didn't know how to attach a Word document onto, you know, his email to send it to career services. It was his resume that he was working on. And it amazes me how our students, you know, we talk about this Generation X or the Generation Y and, and how, you know, they're always on the computer and they have every all these, you know, tech available. But it's amazing to me how many of them have this tech available but don't really know how to use the technology that's available to them. They only know how to use it when it's what they need it for. Yes. For angry birds media. or something. Angry birds that's or something. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So, yes, so I actually took my class as a whole after I saw that and I did an activity in class where I said just real quick I want you guys to type something up on a Word document and I want you to attach it and email it to me so now I have all your email addresses and if I need to get in touch with you I have it and it was amazing how many students were like well I don't know how to do that and these were young kids like kids that are like young enough to be my cat my child and I was just like really you don't know how to attach like a Word document I mean it's just so easy and God help them with PDF files, right? I mean, so you really, right? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm wondering, maybe I should, maybe like with the intro to business or something, maybe we should take a trip down there. It may be a good idea, just as a real quick activity, to say something as easy as that, can you attach it to me, just so I know, and, and make it as, you know, an extra credit assignment that you can do. Something easy, one, one point or two points, or whatever the situation and you will learn so much from your students. And then the grammar is a whole other issue. <laughs> so, yeah. And I'll let Dr. Munoz help with that. <laughs> he says all his students have perfect grammar. Oh. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> all right. So I want to spend the next few minutes um, discussing students' effort. All right? Um, when I say effort, I mean students' motivation or their initiative building, making them, let me rephrase that. Okay, so how many of you have young children? I obviously know Dr. Harris does. <laughs> okay, so I have, you know, I have, I have kids at home, or you maybe have nieces and nephews or however, and you look at them and you're like, why can't you just take the initiative to take the trash out? Why can't you just see the trash out? And, and you're like walking by it and you're adding to it and you don't think, oh, I need to take it and go put it in the trash. No, you just let them fall all over the place. You just, just don't think about it. Well, I have students that don't take the initiative to do simple things like that. So how do you, as an instructor, and what I'm going to have you do, I love these post-it things because we're going to hang them up is how do you create or how do you um, teach a student to be take the initiative on something? How do you do that? And it's all about how are you motivating them, but it's more about, it's not even about motivation at this point. It's really just taking initiative to do something. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes. to say, 
needs to be done, and you need to do this. How do you make them realize that, you know what, I may need extra credit? And how would you get them to say it before, without coming out and saying, okay, I'm going to give you some extra credit. I need you to do this assignment. You don't want, you don't want to do this, right? You want them to come to you. Because you want them to take the initiative and say, I need to do this. How would you do that? I have no idea. Are you still taping it? <laughs> better, better, better pause it for a minute. I have a question for you. How many of you knew that on your rubric it states that you actually get marked if your classroom is in pods? How many of you knew that? What is pods? These are pods. So if your classroom isn't set up in the Inspire model with pods, that may be one thing that you could get knocked off for because what this is doing is you see how I have you broken up into groups? Well, during your class activity, you have your groups working together and it creates a community at the table. And so that's why CCI Corinthians has decided to go with the pod method to help create community among your students in the classroom when you're doing these student-centered activities. And also, it helps when the instructor also gets graded on if they're moving around the classroom and going to each student and asking questions and making sure they're staying engaged. That's another area that you're getting graded on. And so, staying at the front of the classroom, I've been doing a lot of that today. Have you noticed? I'm staying up here because I have a PowerPoint presentation. I don't have a clicker where I can walk back here and I can click it to the next one and I can come over here and ask. So... That was something that I've noticed that I put on classroom observations. If an instructor is doing a PowerPoint and they're not able to leave the front because they have to hit it to go to the next slide, I'm like, we should buy clickers for all the instructors that have projectors because I'm not going to, you know, they may not be able to just go grab them themselves. They need clickers. So that was one of my suggestions. That one thing's kind of strange. I know that I taught one of the A1s, one, the oh, other yeah. one, and I have the power at the one point. And, I'm like, and then black ones at the other end. It's really true. It's so you're like, if you're down here, you're like, you're going to have to move around the other end. Right. Well, you're running back and forth. Yeah. And so when I come out to be lazy, I'm like, yeah, I need, um, John, I need you to go up there. I need you to hit this slide. Well, that's a good idea. Right down here. And make them, and I'm like, I'm going to give you five points today just for helping me out, because I really appreciate it. Well, you know, this husky really doesn't need exercise right now, <laughs> even though I do. <laughs> All right, so this is what I would like to know. We're going to start, and we're going to go the opposite direction. So what did you guys put down for how you get students to take the initiative on something? Well, one thing was, uh, we talked about, we set up in teams, and have a team select for a member, and everybody has to participate in the team. Okay. And, uh, uh, the other thing is both uh, Dr. Mendez and I agree is that we make participation a big part of the grade. And yes. I, don't know how, I don't know what his is. Mine's like a third of the grade. Oh, that's good. That's great. And I tell my people, you know, I'm not as harsh as he is because, you know, he, <laughs> it, you know, I tell them, if you're not there, you're not participating. You can get off for that day. Right. Uh, you know, and so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't give them zero like some unnamed professors do. I'm not that cruel. Uh, <laughs> I get a significant <laughs> penalty. Thank you. No, but that's it is. I mean, it encourages them to come to class because not only are they losing points because they may have missed out on some great information being, you know, talked about, but also just the camaraderie of talking to your fellow classmates about something that maybe they could better explain than what the instructor, how the instructor is explaining it. It also helps with that. So yeah, yeah. that's good. I have, I have a lot of students, whenever I can, like the ones that have problems like accounting and so forth, finance, I'll have them up on the board. I have them rotate through, and I have like to pick a role, and I say, oh, here's my volunteer. I don't get the volunteer. I say, oh, here's my volunteer list. Yes, that's and great. I, should, <laughs> I that's go good. through that way. All right, so what do you guys have? Oh, I'm going to start. Lead by example, give options, be approachable, flexible, engaging, reward, acknowledgement, homework passes. Oh, I don't know what the, the, the um, Oh, the acronym. I'll know where you stand up. Okay, I know where you stand up. That's great. So how often do you, so when you talk about, is that like giving the student like what their progress is in the class? Right. Okay, yeah. all right. And so how often do you guys do that? I do it once a month. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So you like round about like midpoint? Yeah, because I, I need to make sure that they study for my final. Well, no, that's, that's good. funny she <laughs> says that because I always, my students in the midterm, I say, okay, here's the midterm. You need a block in time to study. And I always feel bad about doing that. And I, but I used to, before I did that, sometimes I get feeling people didn't study for the midterm. Oh, they don't. They don't so I always have to, so I always say, okay. And I've had students that walk in and say, oh, is the midterm today? You know, I've been like, you know, shoot me now. <laughs> oh my God. I'm 
Absolutely. And then, what's that homework passes? What's, what's that? It's me, let's say. I use it a lot to encourage them to go out, you know, like go on a real cool field trip, the badges are bang. They won't do it unless you bribe them. So. That's how I do it. <laughs> so you should put bribing on there. Yeah, so. bribing. <laughs> bribing, bribing. Bribing them to take the initiative on something. Right. They learn the same thing, basically. Right. And at the end, they're going to be appreciative <laughs> that you bribe them to go to begin. So yes. Reward is a better right. kind of bribe. Uh, yes, no, that's, I'm, that's I'm hilarious. hilarious. One thing I do is I have students propose their own questions for the test. I give them extra credit. I'll say, if you can write a good question, a test question, and then turn it out, give them extra credit. Because that gets them thinking about what would be a good test question. Right. Like, and then multiple choices. So I'll say, okay. And so I'll say, you know. And of course, if your question is selected, you know one of the questions on the next test. That's right. You should know what the answer is. <laughs> And shame on you if you miss it. Yes. <laughs> All right, so what do you guys have here? Nothing. Yes, you do. Don't say that. <laughs> All right, Mr. Spivak, they're, they're looking at you. I, they're looking at me, they but I'm reading it upside down. Okay, <laughs> what we're talking about on one level here is also uh, to energize students, keep it real. Mm -hmm. make, make sure that the information connects in some way uh, to the person's life. Yes. It's much more interesting if it's something that you can think about Absolutely. and how it affects you. <coughs> also, what's this word? Immediate gratification. Immediate gratification is something they can, uh, use, yeah. they can use now. Yes, right. absolutely. And is it something that you that you want to say? <laughs> and uh, what is this? An example of what? Benefits. A small amount of added effort can help. You really did a great job. Tom. I know. You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> really? And so do you tell your students that? You did a great job today? All the time. That's a good one. Okay. Uh, it's very important from uh, the perspective of the teacher uh, to... Mm -hmm. Not only give feedback, but praise yes. and acknowledge. Yes. And when people are, are coming out of shell, I just had one uh, in uh, oral communications who kept telling me how frightened she was. To get up and speak. And she was looking for all kinds of ways to get out of it. And we had discussions about it. And then in the end, she did a really wonderful presentation on foster care. She had been a foster child and what foster care meant to her. And it was that was one of those things that made a difference, not only for her and her ability, the way she thought about herself, but it made a difference for me seeing that I made a difference for her. No, and that's good. And that's what I was telling you, is the thank you, know, I say it's a thankless job, because how often do you get the thank you? I mean, you may not get it as often as you want to hear it, but when you do get it, it makes you feel good. Yeah. It was just that she would, that she did it, and she came in. She said, "I never thought that I could do it," and then I got to praise her again, and it's totally different. Absolutely. So now that you brought up that, that's a great thing. So on your rubric, it's actually on page eight. It talks about used motivation techniques, and to get a five, it says that gave students feedback as quickly as possible, rewarded success shared ideas, knowledge, and accomplishments of individual students with the entire class, provided specifics when giving negative mm -hmm. feedback, avoided demeaning comments, and refrained from conceding to the student's request for the answers. And so, you know, you have so many times when nobody wants to say anything, and, and so it would be so easy for you to just say, okay, well, here's what it is. This, this is what I'm looking for. No, you're trying to get it out of them. You're trying to see what they're going to say, what they can contribute to it. And so that's actually two. Classroom is part of, part of classroom management by creating a positive, supportive learning environment. And so those are two areas where if you're giving feedback in the classroom, we're going to see how you do the feedback when you're asking your individualized questions or when you ask the class question, how they're responding and how you're responding back to them. And so, again, we want to see that you're engaged with your students. All right, so real quick. It says, do you agree? Intelligence is something you can't really change. Do you strongly disagree? Do you just disagree? Are you neutral? Or do you agree? Or do you strongly agree? I strongly disagree. You disagree? Any others? 
Then I'm neutral. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. There's no right or wrong answer on this. So, for those that strongly disagree, why? Why do you strongly disagree? Well, I mean, a lot. Of, I mean, what is intelligence? I mean, a lot of times, it's people just don't have experience and showing them methodology. I tell them I'm giving them a toolbox. Here's your toolbox problem, ratchet on there, you can go. Like at one time I was tutoring athletes and the problem would come and I could I could see the solution immediately and they're like, how could you do that? I said, well, I've been doing this for 10 years. You know, after 10 years, you sort of can see what the answer is going to look like and you can work your way toward the answer. And that's intuition and you don't get that, the first time you see the problem, you know, you look at the problem and it, it really is Greek. Sign and cosine, it's Greek. Yes. You know? So, but, but after you've been doing it for a while, you can sort of see, well, if it's got sine and cosine, then the answer must be sort of sine and cosine. And you can see what the answer must sort of look like. So you feel it. like it's something that can be learned. Right. Okay. Somebody else that strongly disagree? Yes. Well, you strongly agree? Yeah. Because even if you give them the toolbox, their underlying IQ is still going to be That's right. The variable is open at the end. I kind of, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I get the A, the B. I can't relate intelligence to height. You, you're, you're only going to get what God gives you, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, you're going to have somebody that's short, you're going to have somebody that's tall, somebody that's medium, but at the end of the day, now, you were saying, Dr. Kills, I, I agree with the thing. You can change study habits and you can change great performance, but it still doesn't determine your intelligence. And intelligence shouldn't just be measured on, oh, well, you were a B student in finance before in and, 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 and intro, and then you got an A in investment. So I increased your intelligence. Not necessarily so. Maybe I changed some habits and you learned some dough material that made your knowledge more increased, but it still doesn't change your intelligence. So intelligence shouldn't just be measured just on, oh, well, just on singular performance. So I just think I'm, I'm more neutral about that. Well, so I, I think your intelligence is basically your ability, your ability to learn. Okay. And so... Uh, that's why they used to have IQ tests. They no longer uh, have IQ tests be uh, are valid anymore because they really can't, I guess, zone in on really attaining what a per person's uh, intelligence level is. There's like a real a way to sort of measure it properly. I have a question for you, and this is just playing devil's advocate for any way you answer it. All right, so. I feel like there's different kinds of smarts. You have street smarts, you have book smarts, you have common sense. And I know an individual that is, I mean, they naturally are smart, and it kills me because they're not using that intelligence the way I feel like they should be using it. But they are really smart. And so, but they're not so smart when it comes to common sense. And so some people would say, God, they're just really stupid. Like, what the heck is wrong with them? Like, they're just dumb. And I'm like, no, they're not dumb. I'm telling you, they're, they're pretty smart. Lots going on up there, but you really might not. I mean, there's some practical <coughs> things. And so have you ever thought that maybe what we think about as intelligence isn't necessarily what we think about when it comes to the IQ of how, and you're right, it is about learning. But it's how what we have and how we apply it. Like what exactly we have in us to apply the way that we think. This is a semantic issue more than anything else. I think, I think you can learn how to learn it. That's part of what we do as, a te as I teach people. Right. How, how You see the problem, then how do you attack the problem? Right. What, is the, what does the solution look like? What could the solution be? You know, if it's a multiple choice question, you know, okay, there's four there. If two of them are right, you know, look for the, all of the above answer, you know. And if you can, if, if you can see two are wrong, you've got it down to two shot there. And you know, try to. The part of it's how to how to attack the problem, learn how to learn. And I would think that's how Mr. Hawkins was saying that um, you're showing someone a study habit, or you're showing them how to how yeah, to you can approach improve it. habits and you can improve right. methods, but it's intelligence wise. I think that's on a right. overall broad stroke. So does the does the person actually have the capability to understand? Exactly. What, what we're and that's part of intelligence. So guess right. what? You you have that capability. Okay, well, I was studying wrong here. Maybe if I do a little more application, because like I said, what I teach is I don't. You really don't do a lot of memorization. You have to actually go in and do right. it. So if you know the methodology behind to apply it, then yes, I think that's why I'm neutral about it. You can change some things that can improve your performance, but just 
you're giving with what you're giving. Right. How you work it. As, Ms., <laughs> as Mimi said, you don't know the intellect of our students. I mean, you may have an idea of what you think their intellect is just by the way that they have, you know, shown you various things or the way that they perform, but we don't know 100% what's going on inside or where, really where that capability is until we as instructors try to bring as much as we can out of them. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, Dr. Hills is right to where he can help them see another way to do it. And you can try to show them how to do it in different ways, but we can't sit there and say, I don't think this person is intelligent because sometimes you have a student and you're like, damn, they're dumb. Like, God, I just like, oh, I don't know why they're in this class. But really, is it laziness? Is it not taking the initiative? Is it because this information is just, it's not engaging for them? So you really have to kind of step back. And I'm not saying it's always gonna be like that, but sometimes you have to just really step back and say, am I giving them the benefit of the doubt? I, that's really what we have to do. We have to give them the benefit of the doubt of, you know, I know you're smart, I, I know you got it, and I'm gonna try every way I can, but I just can't, I can't leave it a horse to water and make them drink. Right. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna give you all the tools, but if you don't want me to, so be it. And in all fairness, there are uh, multiple kinds of intelligences, and we may be talking to certain kinds. Right. And not to others in which the student may excel. Yes, yes. And the other, the other thing that strikes me is, I know people that have a lot of knowledge, but it's out of a book and it's in their head. And I think one of the key things I find challenging is to find something that's happening right now. Newspaper, something they've seen on TV, and say, look, this is the real world, right. so that they see that what they learn in theory or as an academic exercise that. is for real, and then I think then I see a lot more understanding, and that's why I always look in the newspaper for something that touches yes. uh, an issue and I say, well, all right, we talked about this, so we, and here is an example of yesterday or the day before the newspaper, and this is how it works in real life. And part of your rubric wants to know, is the instructor taking the information that you're teaching them and applying it to a real life career application? You're being graded on your rubric for that when you in your teaching methods and your methodologies and so again that's great because when you can take this and it may be something the students are like I don't understand why I need to know this you can say well let me give you an example of why and it's a current or something in, that you've experienced in your profession this is why I'm, I'm gonna tell you it's weird and it's like crazy but I'm telling you those weird incidences this is why it happens you have to say that oh, <clears throat> I was just, um, as you guys were thinking, um, I mean, talking, I was thinking that when we look at intelligence, we often look at it from a subjective standpoint mm -hmm. in terms of we put ourselves into those situations and say, well, when I was this age, I was able to accomplish right. and so on and so forth. And I think the ultimate goal when we're teaching our students is to promote self yes. and get a better understanding of the students you the are trying to teach. Um, it's easy to say that I'm giving you a, a box of tools and I want you to apply this information, but I think in our capacities, it, it takes us going one more step and getting to know our students first yes. to see how we can encourage them to take those tools right. and utilize them. Because, because a screwdriver may need to be used, but absolutely. they don't need a screwdriver, maybe they need a hammer. Exactly. Meet them where yeah. they are. We need to meet them where they out. are. You've got to meet them where they are, or else you're just going to be teaching a subject right. that nobody gets. Exactly. Anything, you're going to be frustrated, the students are going to be frustrated, and then your attrition is going to go down, and then we're not yes. going to have a school and jobs, and then I'm going to hurt somebody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing, yes. One thing I always, I always tell my students the first class on domain direction, I say, this class is not about me. I already have my degree, I already have my TTA. Right. This is not about me, this is about you. And I tell them, I, because I've met instructors before, they try to, you know, prove how intelligent they are, how much smarter they are, and I tell them, no, that's not my point. My point here is not to, to, to show how smart I am. That's not what it's all about. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I, I wonder sometimes, because it, it seems like some instructors seem like their whole point is to, to show off. Is to show off, what they you know, have. I'm smarter yeah. than you. I tell them, no, it's not about me. It's about that, you. That is. And, you know, I've already got my degree. I don't need to get my degree. I've got, all, I've got a terminal degree. That's the end of the line. Right. Right. <laughs>
about today's in service. All right, so your rubric, like I said, you're warm, welcome. You know, these are for you to keep. I want to make sure that if you have any questions about the rubric and how it's graded, please um, come see me. I'll be more happy to go over it with you. When we do have guests that come into our classrooms and do a classroom observation, they will be going by this to grade you. And so that's why we want to make sure that you have all the tools in your toolbox to understand um, how to perform better in the classroom. All right, thank you so much. Good job. Good job. So we'll just do some quick housekeeping uh, for spring 2014. Every every syllabus, every syllabus, every roster <coughs> must have a syllabus. I, I, I reviewed some of the rosters this last term, and they were half of the rosters in that syllabus. So make sure you make a copy of your syllabus, put it in the roster. That has, has to happen for this term. So review, you know, get your syllabus together and then make sure it's in the watch list. Uh, the syllabus is the contract with our students, so make sure day one you review uh, what's in the syllabus because that's the contract they have with us. You know, and what's, gonna, what, what's gonna be happening in the classroom, what they need to know should be in the syllabus, and make sure that's done day one. And you can always do it day two. If you're teaching Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, first week of class, review your syllabus day one, the first session and then the next session again. If you're teaching on at nights, once a week, do it for the first two weeks. Remember, the first two weeks is add drop, so we'll be adding students or students will be changing classes. So you <coughs> want to be very flexible with uh, your planning and organizing of your class classes. Uh, the policy of CCI, you must call students when they're, not, when they're not here. You have to call them. The phone numbers are all in the rosters. Uh, if students are out, it's our responsibility as instructors to find out what's going on with them. Because remember, we're a career school, and we need to lay the rules up, up front. But at the same time, if you could do it in such a way whereby students are accountable and they call you when they're not coming, or just like the job environment, but we need to be able to reach our students. If you're having trouble reaching your students, program directors or myself, you must make sure we know immediately because once they've gone one week, two week, we don't know what's going on. It'll be very difficult to get in contact with them. So that's critical. Communicate, communicate, communicate. You're not an island. This school is so small. You know, don't just be in your own classroom. Get, you know, one of the things we were planning to do was everybody in this room, we should have everyone's cell number. So we have what I call a community. We all engage, covering for one another, because we're one big family, so we want to make sure we start a list right now. Write your name, you can start it right now, have a list going on with your cell number, your name, so we could have a list and make copies for everybody, so we could get started <coughs> before we leave today. Lenore's going to start it. Okay. Keep your classes lively. No one listens to a boring professor. Oh God, you don't want to be boring. <laughs> and my rule of thumb is this, and I use the frequency. What's in it for? What's in it for them? What's in it for you? If you could use that frequency of WIFM, WIFM, you know, WIFFM, WIFFU. And what's in it for them? What's in it for you? What's in it for the school? As long as you could, you know, and this was covered in the in service today. As long as students could see the value of why they're here, what's in it for them, that's half the, half the deal. So make sure that's done in the classroom all the time. Cliffhangers is huge. Why is cliffhangers huge? Because it's just like the soap opera. You know, when things are going on TV, you always want to know what's going to come on next. So give them that preview of what to expect the next class so that they want to come. Get them entertained. We're entertainers. Believe it or not. Yes, we're educators, but we're entertainers in the classroom. We're edutainers. There you go. Edutainers. That's the, that's the word. Edutainers. <laughs> Group work is encouraged. You know, if you want to keep students in the class, give them a quiz before the end of class. It says, oh, my class is too bad. They leave class at 8 o'clock, 8.30. No. If you have a quiz towards the end, 
like about 9.15 or 9.20, that will count towards their grade, they'll stay. But make it presented very first, the very first day of class, they make it part of your syllabus so that there's a contract involved. Attendance entered on the portal promptly. All instructors should have access to the portal to enter your attendance. It is critical because one reason why attendance is critical if it's not entered, the computer counts the days they miss. And once they miss 14 consecutive days, or even, no, 10 consecutive days, a letter is generated. The letter goes out to them and says, warning, you've missed so many days. And 14 days, you're dismissed. So that's critical. All right, last thing. Your surveys for end of class, classroom surveys. This past term that ended yesterday, there were things that I saw which was very unpleasant. Uh, so how do we correct that as instructors? Even though the survey is about you, select somebody in the class that will administer the survey, but make sure you read the instructions. Students have to use pencil. They can't write on the survey, you know, the paper. There's a scantron in the, inside the envelope. Use the scantron, read the questions, use pencil <coughs> to shade. I got some surveys back yes, this last week. And some of them, the scantron was never used. Well, I don't wonder there no, weren't any scantrons in there. Well, if, if there's no scantron, then make sure you come get me or the registrar's office and say there's no scantron. You review what's in the envelope first before you give it out. If there's no scantron, make sure there's scantron. And then read the instructions out to the, you know, read the instructions, sorry, then get somebody to administer this survey while you've gone. Any other housekeeping things that I might miss, Joe? Uh, well, I just want to kind of, have we talked about attrition? No. <laughs> um, I just want to mention then there are schedules uh, floating around, and every instructor should have their schedule with them. So let's just discuss a moment. If, God forbid, you're running late or are not going to show up, if you get hit by a truck, or you get run over by a train. Um, what I would like to see, especially among my folks, is that you know who is on the schedule. And if you're going to be running a few minutes late, call, text someone in that time slot, and have them go to your classroom, write something on the board, an assignment, Please start chapter one, review questions at the end of the chapter. You know, instructor will be here in, you know, in 15 minutes. And then, once you've contacted your backup, then keep me in the loop. Say, just, you can text me, hey George, I'm running 10 minutes late, but uh, Dr. Larby is uh, writing something on the board in my class to cover that for the, you know, until I get there. So I would just ask you that you find someone that can fill in for you, that can cover for you, and then just let me know what's going on. If you cannot find someone to, uh, to cover for you, then let me know right away, and um, I'll get someone. But I would, you know, it would behoove you to, to find someone to help you out. This has worked in the past immensely. All the instructors whether it be they need to uh, take a day off and they need a sub or they need to fill in for somebody, they need to cover for somebody. Uh, we've all helped one another in the past. It works very well. And the key is to have everyone's cell phone number. So that's why we're circulating. Can, can we get copies? And yes. And, uh, I'm going to type it up and email it out. Yes. yes. Okay. Anything on the no, I'm pretty good. I just want to make sure um, I put my number on there for my um, business folks and even for general education. Even for CJ, if you can't get in touch with George, please um, feel free to contact me. And um, my office is right next door to George's well where Dr. Inucci was at. So, yes, yeah, so please, if you, um, if you want to discuss anything with me, I'll be happy to, to sit with you. All right, so now it's time for round table. And surprise, surprise, guess what? We have lunch. Woohoo! We have lunch. We have some sandwiches from Jimmy John's. All right. And it's mixed sandwiches, so you'll select 
among yourself which ones you want in this debate. But we have about, I think we have 15 or 16 sandwiches. I'm not sure how many, but we have sandwiches. So that's mine. But let's go around the table. Go around the room and anything you want to share before we close out. We'll start off with Dr. Jojo. Uh, I'm good. There's nothing to share. Um, too sexy for my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. You're not going to let that down. You'll never let that down. You'll never let that down. Please erase, erase. We have a lot of stuff out there. I'm happy to share. Um, no. I'm happy to be here. Okay. Dr. Kills? Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm always uh, eager to learn. Anybody has any new ideas? All right. Dr. Harrison? Good. Mr. McMahon? I'm fine. Yes, uh, George. Yeah, that was one of my students, Jessica. Miss Cruz. I'm good. Miss Hawkins. Good. Thank you. Miss Neil. Miss Steve. At my age, I'm happy to be anywhere. appreciate the opportunity. I do want to say something though. Um, going back to the intellectual conversation we were having, and everybody has their own opinion on that. Obviously, you know, we went back and forth. But honestly, my opinion is I don't accept I can't. People learn differently. We use different functions. You can nurture different ways of learning. But I don't accept that I literally cannot understand that. No. If we have to figure out a way to put it in your brain, we will figure it out. I just... I understand the and I think IQs are a little bit arbitrary. I don't really believe in the actual number, but I, I feel like any individual, minus of course a mental disorder or something to that extent, can learn whatever it is we're trying to put in their head if they want to. That's the big key. If they want to. Right. I'm good for the day. <laughs> Yeah, there was one more thing. Did we mention attrition? Yeah. <laughs> uh, What's attrition? So you know that all of you, uh, when there's a student missing in class, we circulate emails to let all the other instructors know that they're missing. So uh, perhaps we can uh, just beef up those emails a little bit as to what you've done, if you've called them, uh, the results of the call, was it uh, disconnected? Um, did, did they have a cell phone? Did you try it? Were you able to leave a voicemail or not? Did you try emailing them? Because if you've done all these things and it haven't worked, then uh, it'll get kicked up to, to me, and then I'll do everything I can to uh, pursue contacting them. And it's really important that we stay in very, very close contact regarding our students. At the first sign that somebody doesn't show up, we need to be on them and to, to find out what happened, are you just dropping this class, or did they move away, did they get hit by a bus, whatever the case may be, we need to be on top of it, and we need to be on top of it right away. All right? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank you all for, um, for coming today, and I know that um, when I saw that it was on a Saturday, the first thing I thought was, gosh, I'll get to sleep in, and I was like, wow. <laughs> but, I just want to say, um, I, it was a little intimidating to come to the linear side after being with the modular side for so long, and uh, it's, um, I hope that you're patient with me if I have questions, um, and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm just asking questions because that's how I learn, <laughs> so I just ask that you be patient with me, and I um, am very open about communicating, so please, as um, George was saying, Communicate with me. I'll be more than happy to track down students. I am told a student in Mr. Spivak's class, I'm like, I will hunt you down like the dog you are, and I will find you wherever you're at. I was like, we got to get you in here to register. I was like, i got to get you in here for next term. So, yeah, just um, communicate, communicate, communicate. Now, just to add to Lenora, she just took over the program. Of course, the very first quarter, which is it's already on the, the, the goal of attrition. So. I'm at 5.1. Yeah. And the first two months, so she's already coming with the right attitude to get it done. But that's because of you all. Because of you all.
because you see that your attrition numbers, that wasn't anything to do, I feel like that wasn't like a lot to do with me, that was to do with you and how you are with your students. And so that's why I'm saying if you have anything you want to come vent, I'll vent with you too, believe me. I have lots to vent about, you know, when it comes <laughs> to students. I'll, I'll tell you too, so yes, so come see me. And finally, the word self-efficacy. And that is, the, for me, self-efficacy says it all because you are the, what I call, experts in your field. You are the ones with the talent. You have that expert knowledge, expert power. So once you have knowledge power, using the five pieces of power, you have that power within you. Transmitting it to the students should be something that comes naturally. So you believe in yourself. You know what you're capable of doing. It's a matter of just transmitting it to them realizing that they're here to get everything that you have and you're willing to share, willing to give it all that you have. Uh, thank you for everything you do and let's continue to do the best we can with what we have because we can't change the world but if we could touch one student at a time, which we've, we've always done, yeah. that difference we make is just something that will be cherished for a long, long time because we're making a difference. When it's, you know, it's like Lenora said earlier, seeing a student come years ago, you know, that very first day, every term, and when they finish, it's a beautiful experience because he, he, sometimes you say, I don't think they'll make it, but, but <coughs> that focus and determination is what it's all about. And it's you that makes that difference in the classroom each and every day because you are the leaders in the classroom. You are what we call the coaches in the classroom. You are the ones that make it happen. And as long as you're in the classroom making it happen, the school will stand the test of time. Because you are the foot soldiers. And you are the leaders. So thank you for spending half of your day with us today. And lunch is served. It's about 16 sandwiches. Get a sandwich, some chips, get a drink.